chapter three is gonna focus to the answer to all estate planning questions, handling your assets so your family doesn't have to. This chapter is gonna focus on a revocable trust or also known as a living trust. This is the type of, of vehicle that basically you set up while you're alive. Your assets will go in there. We'll talk about that in a minute. You manage it, you control it, and you benefit from it. So we're not talking about a type of trust where you give up control or ownership. We're talking about a type of trust that leaves you in the driver's seat and lets you keep your assets while you're alive. The key here is, is that when you're gone, your assets do not have to then go through probate and you did not have to put your children as a co-owner on them to get them to pass by operation of law. So the trust is really the answer to the, the question of, well, how do I pass my assets without going through probate? Because as we learned in chapter two, a will does go through probate. So in a comprehensive plan, there are several documents besides just the trust that are equally as important and I have included that in a separate segment that is on the website or attached to the end of this video. And so with the trust though, let's talk about how the trust works. Well, this is actually the best metaphor for a trust, which is a box. Because while you're alive, your estate planning attorney drafts the terms of the trust. And it should be somebody that only does estate planning because like we talked about in chapter one, Having a tax background to understand the implications is very, very important. And then having the expertise to do a trust is really incomparable because some people come to me all the time and say, Don, will you review this trust for me? And, and they hand me this 10 page document and they go, and I read it and I meet with them and they go, well, what do you think it's missing? And I jokingly go about 80 pages. Um, but in reality, the, what a trust is trying to do is avoid going to court, avoid having anything left open to question. So it's important that this document be sufficient enough to provide for all the what ifs. It's going to say, well, what happens if I become incapacitated? Who steps in and manages my stuff to take care of me? It's my stuff. I wanna make sure that that language is in there. What happens if I'm leaving it to my children and the accident that killed me disabled one of my children? Or what if I have a child that's already on Social Security Disability or Medicaid, something that is a need-based benefit? Well, if this trust is drafted properly, we can provide that that child can still get all of their state benefits and still have their inheritance provided for them. So the, the best trusts are ones that cover all the what if provisions, not just you know riding the bicycle on your way to work every day. Well, that might work for the two days a year that it's 70 degrees and beautiful outside, but when things called life happen to us and people predecease or somebody gets a divorce or somebody's getting sued, a well-written trust will provide protection for all of those things. So let's talk about it. So we have this well-written trust. We've carefully selected an estate planning attorney, which we'll talk about how to do in a minute. And we have this fabulous trust. How does our stuff get in there? Well, I will say one of the hurdles that I face is there are a lot of attorneys that draft even great trusts, but then they don't put the stuff in the, in the box. And like you learned in chapters one and two, if your stuff's still out here on the table, it's either gonna pass in the probate box or it's gonna pass in the operation of law box. It has to be in the trust box while you're alive for it to pass under the trust and avoid probate. So like on my house, I would deed my house into my trust. If my spouse were still alive, because remember I killed him in chapter one, but if he came back to life and he's here with us, then he and I would deed our house into the trust. I'd change ownership of my vehicle, our vehicle, into the name of the trust. I would change ownership of stock certificates or in my investment accounts would be owned in the name of the trust. Um, our bank accounts would be owned in the name of the trust. And I get this question a lot. Well, do I have to put trust on my bank account? I don't have trust on my bank account. It's owned in the name of the trust, but my personal checks still just have mine and my husband's name on there personally. It does not say Hallman Living Trust. And the reason is, is I like the anonymity of everybody that I write a check to not knowing I have a trust. I also am concerned that if I get up to Target to write a check somewhere that 
They may not know that I'm the trustee and I can write a check. So I like the anonymity of just leaving individual names on the checkbook itself, but you've signed a new signature card at the bank, so your statements come in the name of the trust. So that's important. Um, beneficiary of life insurance. I actually really like naming the trust as the beneficiary. So let me give you an example. Let's say that I die and the accident that kills me disables my husband. Well, I don't want my life insurance paying straight to him because he's incapacitated in that example. I want it to go into the trust so that I can still use all those great terms we talked about earlier to control the distribution because he is incapacitated. So that's a huge benefit of using a well-drafted trust for all of the needs. Um, IRAs, like we visited with in chapter one, those usually, because of a rollover right, typically name a person as the beneficiary so they pass by operation of law. Even if they name the trust as the beneficiary, which we sometimes do in the case of needing to control the money or minor children or so forth, then it still passes by operation of law and the beneficiary just sort of pours it over into the trust, okay? So that's how that would work. Um, sort of like I'm mixing up something to bake here. You put it in the oven and you pop it out and bing, you have the perfect estate plan. Um, at the end of the day, the trust works very, very well to ensure that on death, the assets that are in trust, I've just removed some for the ease of use here, that the assets that are in trust, then automatically on my death would pass to the successor trustee. You go, okay, so successor trustee gets it, now what? Well, the terms of the distribution are written into the document. And that is where it does work like the movies, where they can literally sit around the conference room table and divvy up the goods. Okay, so in my case, I have minor children, so I don't want them just to have it outright. Or you might have a child that isn't as good with money as you would want them to be just yet. Or you might have a case where you have a special needs child. Or you might have a family farm that you want to leave a legacy plan and you want that farm to stay in trust for multiple generations so that your great grandkids can fish on your pond. Those are all wonderful and easy things to do inside a trust. So like my personal trust uh, says that my children get it at ages 30, 35, and 40. Now they can have distributions any time before then for health, education, support, maintenance. So my children need money to go to college on, to buy school clothes, maybe help buying a car, studying abroad, whatever. My trustee, the person I've put in charge of it after I'm gone, sees that they need, they can use those assets to do that. So it, the same thing works if you have a child that's not maybe not as good with money. It can stay in trust maybe for their lifetime, but still dole out to them as they need it to help them all along the way. Because Really, you're not doing your kids any favors if, you've, if you're helping them out along the way now, and then you just dump this entire estate into their lap after you're gone. Um, you're, you're, doing after, you're, you're treating it after you're gone different than how you're treating it now, and really the continuity of making sure that they're provided for is really important. What if you don't have kids? What if you're leaving it all to charity? Well, the key is, is that having a trust saves the expense of probate. So would you rather an additional 10% of your estate go to charity instead of going to the attorneys? Most people are shaking their head yes. So still a trust is very important even for charitable planning. Now there are some other types of trusts we use for charitable planning. So I encourage you to sit down with, with us or with your estate planner and visit about those because there are lots of options that are provided there. Um, what about making changes to the trust? I get that a lot. What if I want to change the terms of it? What if my child, you know, my child wasn't very good with money and now they are? Absolutely, you can do that. This is a revocable trust, which means you can amend it. So you can change the terms of it. You can change the successor trustees. Maybe your children are older and they're great with money and you want them to be in charge of their own distributions. That's perfectly fine. As long as you're alive and competent, you can change the terms of it. Now, one thing I like to do is that if I have a, a, two spouses that have decided this is how we want our estate to go, I typically will ask them, and usually the answer is yes, do you want to be able uh, to have this locked in place if one of you are gone? I always say that prevents Betty the barmaid and Ted the tennis pro from coming in. 
So if I'm gone, you know, then Betty the barmaid can't come in and hornswoggle my husband into changing the terms and get this. What we've decided on together is going to happen. Now, in my, it, like in my trust, if he spends every last dime taking care of himself with it, then so be it. But at the end of the day, what we've decided together is going to happen uh, after the death of one of us. So the terms of the trust, we can make it where that it locks in. I have some clients that make it where that there's a remarriage restriction. So that if the surviving spouse gets remarried, maybe they just get the income off of it, but they can't touch the principal. I have sometimes I've blended families where they go, well, I want my kids to get, say, the family minerals when I die, but then everything else can be held for the surviving spouse. And then when they're gone, then it splits in this direction or this formula. Easy to do. I always say, if you can dream it, I can draft it. That's what makes my job fun, is that there are no two estates created the same. And like I said earlier, estate planning is an art. It's not word processing. So it's so vitally important that your estate planning attorney does just do estate planning and didn't get somebody a divorce on Tuesday and out of jail on Wednesday and draft your trust on Thursday. Um, because it is such a craft that you only get one bite at the apple. Um, the biggest cases in my office are basically when good estate planning goes bad. And there's nothing worse than having an estate plan where the family thought it was all done and taken care of, and in fact it wasn't. So if you do have a trust and you're not sure is this a good trust, a bad trust, or otherwise, have it reviewed by an estate planning attorney. That's usually not a very, that's usually a very inexpensive process to, to have it reviewed and get, even if it's just getting a second opinion on it. Well, so you want to make changes that's easy to do that's called an amendment. What about having it reviewed? Well, you should do that too. So if you have a trust that's 10 years old, 15 years old, I reviewed a trust the other day that was 40 years old, um, it should be reviewed, we say on average, every two to three years at a minimum. Uh, personally, we offer a trust review plan in our office that lets the client come in on an annual basis for a very nominal charge and, and sit down with them and make sure that the trust is up to date as a matter of law. The law has changed. What's going on? Has their situation changed or have the assets changed? So your attorney doesn't need to be involved every time you move stuff in and out of this box. The attorney just needs to be involved if you're changing the terms of the trust itself. So assets can come in and out of the trust without, again, without attorney or anybody else being involved, just like you do now. You just sign the deed. Instead of signing it individually, you sign it on, on behalf of the trust. You buy a new house, take title in the name of the trust. Just remember everything needs to be in the box. And then at the end of the day, you go, well, I wanna change how the kids get it or who gets it or who's in charge. That's an amendment and you do need an attorney to do that for you. So now in the next segment, we're going to talk about the really important documents that also go with the complete comprehensive estate plan. Because an estate plan, this is a, a, the biggest and probably most important piece, but there are other documents uh, that are involved in making sure that this works seamlessly and effectively. And then in the final segment that you'll see posted on our website or attached to the end of this DVD, is going to deal with the estate tax code. And that is, how does this trust ultimately used to save estate taxes and as, asset, as an asset protection strategy?